So I see this this shift happening in how we express ourselves, right? Through through you know through emojis, and I see that that being extended into these virtual spaces in how we express ourselves with our avatars. They become emotional surrogates, right? Of who we are and how we express ourselves. So how we show up in these spaces is very important. In this episode of Building the Metaverse with John Radoff, John sits down with Kathy Hackle. Kathy is a globally recognized metaverse expert, tech futurist, and top business executive with deep experience working in metaverse-related fields with companies like HTC Vive, Magic Leap, and Amazon Web Services. She's the CEO of the Future Intelligence Group, a leading metaverse consultancy working with the world's top brands on metaverse growth strategies, NFTs, gaming, virtual fashion, and how to expand their brands into virtual worlds. Let's jump into this fireside chat. All right. Welcome, Kathy, to Building the Metaverse. I'm super excited to have you here because I've been following for the last year your work on the metaverse, which is very, very broad. Like It covers a lot of ground. What I was really intrigued by, what I wanted to talk about today, though, is this whole notion of digital fashion, self-expression, avatars. That's a conversation we can just go on and on and on with. But maybe we can start there, like fashion. What do you think people should understand about this whole idea of digital fashion? How does it relate to, you know, physical fashion? Why is this even important? Right. So, you know, f fashion in the physical space has always been important, right? It's, it's self-expression. It is about exploring one's identity, right? Throughout the years, we all change how we dress. And like, there's many implications. Uh, culture, right? Culture happens in, you know, in, in streetwear. And like, there's a, there's a big relationship, relationship between culture and fashion, right? And that's where I think I'm really interested in. And I think that that is the relationship that we should also look at when we're thinking about the metaverse, right? Um, especially right now in, in the virtual worlds uh, that are starting to happen and, and you know, that are happening in these, in, in you know, in, in the idea and the concept of the metaverse. So I'm exploring that fashion seems like a very, you know, a very obvious uh, way to, you know, enter the metaverse in some ways, right? Because it's something that we do physically, we do every day, we make fashion choices every single day, uh, multiple, ch multiple times a day sometimes, right? We'll make fashion choices. So I think that that is being you know, translated in also how we show up in, in some of these virtual spaces. And, and John, when I talk about, you know, avatars and kind of what does that mean? And what is the relationship with fashion? What, right. I always explain this. So right now, many people have texted a friend or family member and they've probably sent an emoji, right. To represent, a, you know, a feeling or an expression. Like they didn't even write a sentence. They just sent an emoji or a couple of emojis. Right. Mm -hmm. So I see this, this shift happening in how we express ourselves, right. Through, through, you know, through emojis. And I see that that being extended into these virtual spaces in how we express ourselves with our avatars They become emotional surrogates, right. Of who we are and how we mm. express ourselves. So how we show up in these spaces is very important. Um, you know, I, my biggest teachers about the future are my children. Um, and I see kind of how they show up in these spaces, right? And it's important to them. Like how they dress their avatar is very important to them. You know, sometimes depending on the occasion, even more important <laughs> than what they're wearing to school. So, so yeah, I think that fashion just makes sense. It's a, it's an interesting place to start and we can definitely go down the rabbit hole. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with clients in fashion and beauty which is a little bit harder, right? To kind of pin down and what does that mean? What does beauty mean in the metaverse? But, but we can definitely start with fashion. So there's a, there's a broader trend that we could probably expand out to, which is this whole idea of one's physical representation versus one's digital representation and how important the digital aspect of that has become over the last few decades, really, that the last few years especially. But one of the mega trends that I've written about is just this idea that today so many of us find it to be even more important to express ourselves through our digital identity than our physical identity. Are you seeing anything like that as well? 
Yeah, definitely seeing that. I think that we're spending, you know, I think with the rise of social media, we're, we spend a lot more time curating uh, who we present ourselves in, in those digital spaces. And that's obviously translating into virtual spaces. Um, yeah, I think it's an evolution. Also, I think as we evolve further, right, into some of these virtual spaces, we're also going to try on, in some ways, different identities. Mm. Right? So... That, that really excites me, right? Because we're going to, just like we all change throughout the decades of our lives, um, I think our virtual personas will adapt as well, right? So I definitely see that happening. And, and one of the big questions um, that I also get asked when it comes to that is like, do we always have to be a cartoony avatar? And I say, no, not really. I mean, sometimes you're going to choose to go between, right, the more realistic version of yourself, probably some volumetric capture slash hologram, for lack of a better word, um, representation of yourself, right? If you're doing a business meeting, you might show up as that. Or if you're, if you're, a, you know, a CEO and you're doing, you're showing up in the virtual space, probably you're going to show up more as a volumetric version of yourself, closer to reality. And but sometimes, if I'm socializing with friends, I might want to be a pink dragon, right? So, uh, so I think it's going to be we're going to be very fluid in how we represent ourselves. Um, beyond, you know, just, I'm not going into gender specifically, but the fluidity and kind of how we represent ourselves, uh, and how we express ourselves. We're going to try on different identities, just like we try on different outfits. And I think that that is very, very empowering, very exciting. Right. And, and yeah, I think that for, for, for everyone, especially I think for women, and, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to speak as, as a woman, right. During the, the web 2, 2.0 times, like Instagram, influenced many young women, right, to have an ideal of beauty, right, that was represented as the Instagram, Instagram influencer. I think as we go into more Web3 and more of these virtual spaces, the ideas of beauty are going to change and they're going to evolve. Mm -hmm. And I think beauty is going to be even more expansive. It's not going to be just one set that you have to be in the physical world, right? Because, you know, I'm five feet tall. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I always joke in the metaverse, I can be six feet tall or I could be three feet tall, whatever height I want to be, right? I don't have to conform to a specific way of looking. And that to me personally seems empowering uh, because it doesn't mean that I always have to show up, you know, I don't have to aspire to always be a Kardashian, right? I can be whoever I want to be. Even like, once again, I could be a pink dragon. <laughs> um, so I think that there is something empowering there when it comes to self-expression, finding one's identity, understanding one's, you know, oneself. And, and as a woman or as anyone, really, especially teenagers, like, I feel it's empowering in some ways. Yeah, and also not just empowering, I think emancipatory as well. So you, you touched on gender for a moment and didn't go there. I'll go there for a moment because actually when I met my wife in an online game, I was playing yeah, a female yeah. character in an online game. And, and I think that games is actually where a lot of this has begun. And I think there's a lot of, you know, ways of expressing ourselves. There's a lot of parts to who we are and being able to play with that and have a playful space to actually be able to explore how we would present ourselves, how we would interact, how we would experience the social systems around us through different viewpoints in life. I think that's actually a really powerful thing, not just empowering, but powerful to be able to experience it as well, because I can't go out into the physical world and do that as well, because I'm going to be limited to who I am in a lot of ways. Um, you know, my body form, who I am, who my, what my identity is, is going to actually limit my options. Whereas in a virtual space, I can be much more playful. I can try a lot of different things. Yeah. And, and I agree. And I'm glad we're going there because I do think that, you know, in physical form, right? What is it within seconds, because we are humans, uh, within seconds of meeting someone in physical form, you make a decision, like, right? Like your brain immediately, like, it's just a, an instinct. You make a decision. I like this person. I don't like this person, right? Uh, or I find them appealing or I don't, right? So I think that that changes, right? Because we've been, we've lived in this physical world for so long that allowing ourselves to be in these, you know, virtual spaces. I love that you met your, your wife <laughs> in a game and you were playing a female character. I absolutely love that. Um, I personally sometimes go into games or experiences in a male avatar just to see if it's different, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't open my mouth, um, but, but, you know, but to see if, if I am treated differently. And I have found that there is a difference, right? Mm -hmm. I personally have been 
you know, <laughs> uh, I remember, I'll tell you a story, an interesting story. So this was back in 20, oh my gosh, 2017 maybe. Um, there was a book called The Fourth Transformation um, that, that mm -hmm. came out at that time. I mean, it was 2017. And I went to the book launch, which was inside, I don't know if it was Altspace or where it was, right? Uh, but I was, yeah, it was Altspace VR. And I went in there. It was kind of one of my first times going into into the kind of the, 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 the type of VR experience. Um, you know, I'm show up as my avatar. And I literally had, and I pardon my motion. I'm going to do the motion that was done to me. So please don't, I hope no, no one gets triggered. But I'm in there in a book launch about a serious topic. And mm -hmm. I had a male avatar come up to me and literally start going in this motion. Right? And um, so once again, sorry, I hope that I won't trigger anyone. Um, but to me, that was like, it took me a second in my brain. And I was like, I was like, what is this person doing? And then I, I all of a sudden I realized what they were doing. And I felt, it, it felt, I, I don't know, I just felt this thing come over me like, like this is not a safe space. Mm. Right? And I remember several of the other people that were at the, at the book, uh, at the book launch also saw it. He got, the person got kicked out and stuff. Um, but it was real. Like, and, and it took a couple of seconds for my brain to realize what was happening. And it started, made me think, you know, I want to feel safe in these spaces, right? Do I always have to come in as a male avatar? That's not the world I want to build for my children, right? So I think that there is a lot to be said on when it comes to representation and how, how do we change the bias, right, that exists already in the physical world? How do we not bring that, you know, bring that? We, we are going to bring some level of it, right? But, but yeah, you know, and I've had multiple experiences throughout my years. I, you know, I don't share all of them, but, but yeah, I think that that was one of the big, like a big shocker for me. Um, and it was very early on. Yeah. People in games especially seem like they have license to, to act and behave any way they want, including many, many ways that, that I don't think they'd ever do in physical reality. Or they this, get thrown in jail if they did, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so in the experience you were having, I'm curious, you, you said it was in alt space or something like, was it a VR experience or a... Yeah, or it, a was space. it was alt space. Interesting, because what, one of the things I... I, believe, I believe I was in VR, I can't remember. One of the interesting things I found in VR that's different than a screen is it, it feels like a lot of the emotional kind of evolved machinery in the brain kicks in in VR in a way that it doesn't on a screen. The, my best evidence of this is to take a look at a product like Rec Room, which for anybody watching who hasn't tried Rec Room, I, I really recommend it because it lets you kind of see these playful spaces that people have formed within this kind of low and really no code environment within space. But the point here is try it on a screen like a mobile device or on your computer screen and then go into like the Oculus version of it where you're in VR. You will feel very different in the space with other people. One of the things that I experienced right away was we're in an online game. Like if you're playing World of Warcraft, everyone's jumping all over each other. Like you might be on the raid boss. Everyone's just crammed in. Like there's no space around you like you'd have in physical space. But suddenly when I was in Rec Room for the first time transitioning from the screen to something immersive, I suddenly felt like I had to give people like a little space around their avatar as well. And it, yeah. it actually felt weird to be cramming too close to someone. Like, I don't know, it was very biological and evolutionary, I think, or at least yeah. acculturated in a way that I didn't experience in a screen. No, a hundred percent. And I think it's that change and that shift. I mean, I've, I've been working in those industries for a long time and we use the word story living, right? This happens to me. Mm. You know, I'm not a passive recipient of the information. I'm an active participant. And I think that that is the big shift. So when, when those things do happen, right, in virtual reality, they feel very personal. Like, I remember them very much as very clear memories in my mind, right? I live through that. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that there is something to be said there about the power of these technologies. We should not, you know, I don't know, we need to set up safeguards. We need to have standards. There's things that need to happen, right? Um, before we all plunge <laughs> into the 3D side of things. Um, so, so definitely. And I know we started with fashion, John, but like kind of we're now going to this more like you know um, societal discussion on it. But I think it's still, you know, I think I think it's very important to have. So, 
Well, I think that's what's interesting about this stuff though, right? Because you start with something like fashion, which is sort of this intersection between art and self-expression. And it leads you to how culture is changing, how we're becoming much more digital and dematerialized in these forms of self-expression. Really, we're talking about a huge change in the way we approach technology and each other through technology. Like, that's the actual big discussion where we can come back to fashion and talk about the super interesting stuff happening there. But as people listen to this or watch this, I want you to be thinking about that. Think about what it means to have this new way of expressing yourself a more emancipated, empowered way of expressing yourself, and then what that means for society and, and how it's going to continue to evolve. But maybe to bring it back to the fashion conversation here, we talked yeah. about the self-expression side of it. There's also the whole creative side of it. Like there's a whole new economy potentially out there for us of everything from big brands who want to enter this space, I think for obvious reasons, to individual creators who just want to make this everything from a bespoke hairstyle to a piece of clothing to you name it so that people have the the stuff that allows themselves to to express themselves in virtual, virtual space how do you think about this whole creator economy that's emerging i think it's a wonderful opportunity it's like a new era right that we're going into and that i'm that's just very powerful for creators, right? Everyone overuses the term creator economy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think it's like a new Gilded Age or whatever. Like, um, I would say, you know, to me, it's an opportunity, right? And I'll give you a personal example. Like, mm -hmm. I never, like, as much as I love fashion and I work with lots of fashion and beauty clients, like, that's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, that's what I'm known for, for my work with those types of brands. But you know, I never envisioned myself as a fashion designer. Like that was not something I was going to ever add to like my LinkedIn and not that I have, but, but you know, the fabricant, which is a, mm -hmm. you know, a pretty much a virtual fashion studio, um, you know, out of Amsterdam, they're doing really mm -hmm. cutting, cutting edge things. They're, they're the ones that sold the first virtual dress, the iridescence. So, um, they reached out and say, Hey, we're launching the fabricant studio. we have season zero. We're asking 50, you know, visionaries to join us. I was one of the ones that got invited and I co-created and collaborated with them to create the godmother of the metaverse, um, you know, ball gown. And it's sold right now as an NFT, but that was, you know, part of my creation. Like I was involved in creating this beautiful, beautiful virtual dress. And I was like, wow, like these new tools and this new era allows me to, you know, we talked about identity, like allows me to also have new roles and and doing things I had never envisioned of do in doing. Um, you know, I'm not saying I'm a full-fledged fashion designer, but it gave me a taste of that. And I was very, it was just a really exciting moment for me to be able to say that. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that these tools that we're creating, these new, new economies, new opportunities that we're creating are just gonna unlock levels of creativity we, we haven't been able to see before uh, or we've or if we have like not at the level we're going to see now um and it's going to give a chance for many people that you know might have had a you know a side hustle or an idea or a dream and they're going to be able to realize it and you saw you probably see this john all the time like in our the nft community nft conversations like these people these artists that have been making digital art for very long were making you know weren't making a lot of money sometimes they were just making it for show and all of a sudden it's like this huge it doesn't mean everyone is making a lot of money but some mm. of them are like you know i just quit my job <laughs> um right i think you see that as well yeah and by the way if, if you're listening to this in the audio podcast version this is a great opportunity to look at the youtube video because we will include some footage here of fabricant so you can see what that looks like and you can see some of the things that people are creating there so this is definitely an episode where you're going to want to see some of the things that people are are making. So ch do check that out. And we'll include some links in the show notes as well, just so people can track these things down. Let's talk a little bit about how digital fashion might be different than physical fashion. One, one is the obvious, like you're not dealing with physical materials, although we'll talk about digital as well, which is sort of an interesting domain to, to riff off further. But so you're not cutting cloth, you're 
working with something like Fabricant and making materials there. What's the, how does the scope of creative expression change with digital fashions, digital beauty, avatar expression in a way that, that is unlocking more creative potential from people than maybe what they're doing in fi the physical world? Yeah, I feel that, you know, in digital fashion, we're not constrained by the, the laws of physics, right? Mm. Um, and, and I got interviewed by GQ uh, not too long ago for a piece that we're doing on, on, on the metaverse in fashion. And, and, and the writer pointed out something very interesting. And it's that both myself and other people that got interviewed, we all said the same thing. In the, you know, in the virtual world, your dress can be on fire. Apparently, you, <laughs> we all have, we all have the same vision. We all yeah. burn ourselves on fire. Like, yeah, and not necessarily what we want to do. It's just, you know, I think we use it as an example. I, I um, love that example so, because... So, yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the first things people tend to think about when they go from physical world to the metaverse is is essentially like remap physical space to from what they're familiar with into the metaverse. So when people think of a music concert, because I've used this example before, their first thinking is, well, I'm going to have the music concert look kind of like the same stadium and the same music experience, but now it's in, in VR, right? Whereas actually, because we're dematerializing space, you can completely rethink of it, first of all. Like you don't have to have a limited number of front row seats. You can have an unlimited number of front row seats. You can get close to the artists in a way that's just, you know, not physically possible for safety reasons, for a lot of reasons. You're raising a whole other one, which is we don't have to be bounded by the physical rules at all, not just the physical rules of real estate and rival space around us, but even things like flames and fire, we could have anti-gravity, we can, we can play with everything. So that becomes a creative space, which is super fascinating. It is, and it is a chance to express ourselves, once again, to create culture, mm -hmm. right? Because I always go fashion and culture, art, obviously you mentioned like they're all, they all, they're all, they all come together in one way. Um, so, you know, I thought that was funny with the GQ or a journalist pointing that out that we're all like, have this dream. Um, but I think that it's, it's, it's a new creative space. Um, yeah. I always, I have a dream in my mind, right. Of a TV show and I'll just, and just walk with me for a second. So mm -hmm. you know how there's alter ego, right. And it's like the, the singers like show up as avatars because maybe they weren't able to make it in, in, in the real, like in the physical world in their current, like for X, Y, or Z, right? And they show up as these avatars, which are more of like their envisioning of what they would show up as an artist. I envision, I have this idea in my head of a TV show, a competition. Uh, you know how you have Project Runway? <laughs> so it's kind of mm -hmm. like that, but taking alter ego. So it would be like pairing traditional designers that use fabric and cloth and, you know, and drape and, and everything with with uh with game developers mm -hmm. and putting them together to create virtual fashion lines mm -hmm. right and then have a, a panel of judges i would be one judge that was my, that's my dream uh right and you would have you know from the traditional uh, fashion space you know, someone like myself or like you would have a kind of this team of judges that judge these new and totally you know crazy amazing new creations and I can envision how hard it, you know, it's going to be, there's going to be controversy. There's going to be, you know, because you're going to have to, the designer is going to have to speak to the game developer and the game developer is going to have to speak to the designer. And there is going to be a little bit of controversy there, but I think that's what makes it fun because they're creating something new. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have that vision in my head of this, you know, this show <laughs> and I think it'd be really interesting. I hope someone, you know, picks it up one day, but um, but yeah, I think that there could be so much fun there in showcasing, you know, how does this flow in an avatar? How does this work in an avatar? And then John, and, and then I think a lot about like, not just the virtual fashion, the direct to avatar thing, but like, how does that extend into augmented reality? Once we have glasses, mm -hmm. right? What does my dress have? To, I'll have fabric on, right? Cause I still have mm -hmm. to protect my body and wear something. But what if the fabric through the glasses does something completely different? So, so yeah, I'm thinking through all of that. Yeah, the digital stuff is super interesting. Just before we move on to digital, although that's there's a lot we can explore there. Like, I love your idea, by the way. So there's a game in Roblox 
game may not even be the right term in experience in Roblox. I think it's called fashion show or something or, or something like that. Fashion uh, famous? Oh, is it fashion famous? Well, it's the one where you go into a store and you have a couple minutes to sort of run through the store, pick out your outfit yeah. according to a theme which you've been given, and then there's a competition yeah. where everyone sort of goes down the runway and presents themselves, mm -hmm. and then there's a voting. Fashion process. famous. Yeah. So first well, of all, I had four kids playing Fast and Famous over the weekend at home. So yes. <laughs> there you go. So like, first of all, there's that's amazing because I don't think that's a game which would have ever gotten funding from a traditional game studio, for example. Like it, it would have been very difficult to create as its own standalone experience. It has become possible in a environment like, like Roblox just because of the fact that there's a lot of people there and you've got this portability between worlds and whatnot. So it's create, and it's also just a lot easier to make stuff. So you have these mini experiences, these mini games that can be launched into the whole ecosystem there. So we already have one of the base use cases for your idea. Like people already thought that was fun. Now, how do you create the show around it? Well, we've had concerts, we've had, the fashion game, like I could see that mashing together. That's one of the really interesting things about this concept we call the metaverse, which I just really think of as the next generation of the internet. That's, that's my version of it, but it's around all these trends like immersiveness and self-expression and, you know, spaces we can go exist in and creator economies and real time interaction. But what we're going to see is a lot of things that are not quite games, not quite pure consumptive experiences where it just gets mashed up in a way that is opening up a whole set of experiences not really possible through anything else today. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and just, you know, from a creative perspective, just unleashes, you know, new opportunities. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm writing a, a book called The Metaverse Economy, um, mm -hmm. you know, your guide to making sense of business and Web 3.0 or I mean, working title. We still have to finalize the title. But I think it's, it's really interesting to think about those business opportunities that are going to ha happen. Right. And for brands like for the brands I work with, they're mm -hmm. thinking about how is this a new revenue stream? Um, how do we engage consumers in new ways? Um, you know, how do we meet them where they are as well and give them what they want? So I think it's, it's a great, you know, there's some great opportunities happening here. So there's a lot of brands entering the space, big brands, a lot of even smaller brands, but how, how are brands thinking about this and, and how are you counseling them to think about the metaverse and, and how are they thinking about everything from fashion to what it even means to be a brand in these spaces? So the brands that are working with me, I'm really spending time with them to think about holistic, meaningful strategies, right? That focus on authenticity, community, utility when possible, uh, and really thinking about that, not just the one-off marketing PR pop, right? That a lot, of, a lot of them want that, you know, stake in the ground, we're the first ones to do X. Um, but some of the brands that I've been working with for over a year, like they're already started, you're, like one of them, and I can't really say the name right now, They've already done several things and every time it just keeps getting better for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I love to see them grow. I love to see them, you know, expand and do more experimentation and have meaning behind it, make it meaningful and, and really start to think about, you know, not just what I think I need to create and give my audience or my community, but really, what do they really want to see? Right. How do you, the thing is like, I always go back to this, like, as children, like, right, we, you know, for example, my children, I'll give an example, love Elmo. Like, so with Elmo, like, we would buy the Elmo doll and the Elmo toy and the Elmo book. When you love something, when you're a fan of something, you want to engage with it in many form factors. And I think that that is going to be further amplified in a massive way in, in these virtual spaces, right? And eventually in the, in the, you know, the real world metaverse or like augmented reality. So that for brands is an opportunity right? To really be all, go beyond some of the limitations that they have right now and think about what do we become? How do we translate our brand into the metaverse? What do we become? And like with my beauty clients, I'll be like, do you have to be lipstick in the metaverse? Maybe not. Maybe you're something else. Maybe you come something different. And I think that there is a chance there for evolution, not only like we talked about for ourselves and how we express ourselves, but also for the brands. 
and how they engage with with you know with with new consumers and yeah and how, what are the new form factors like that what that's what excites me what are the new form factors <laughs> you know might not have form because they're dematerialized but you know what are the new form factors that will happen in these spaces and how are brands gonna the, the brands that are smart are the ones that get, they're gonna get it that are gonna understand that they need to evolve and that this in itself this moment in time is a pivotal and amazing opportunity for them yeah, and you, you I used the word community a moment ago, and, and to me, that's one of the things people have to be thinking about carefully because there's this continuity between the concept of a brand and the idea of a community because the community is sort of the people embodying your brand. In some ways, your community really owns the brand even more than the company for many companies. And there's some people that are going at this as like, you know, a cash grab, I suppose, and they're just going to throw something out there and, and see if they can make a little bit of money at it. But of course, that's not going to really sustain within your community because your community will see through that pretty quickly. So I, what I'm hearing from you, though, is really listen to your community, engage with them and try to understand what it is that they want to do with your brand and how they want to incorporate it into their identity online. Yeah, and almost what are the chances to co-create, right? That's, that's mm. a lot of brands are allergic to that, right? <laughs> like giving RIP to someone, but, uh, right? But it's like the idea of co-creation. I think there's a lot of power there. And I always bring it back to this. It, it's about community and it's about the future of fandom, right? If I am a mm. fan of a brand because that brand is aspirational to me or I have an emotional tie or I really just love the design, right? How does the future of fandom evolve? Right. And that includes brands. That includes how people engage with brands. Right. Some people are super fans. So um, so I think that there's a lot to explore there, a lot of work being done. And at least the brands I work with, I counsel them. Right. Uh, don't just jump. You can jump in. Right. Some of them have jumped in. And then after they jumped in and put the stake on the ground, they come to me and say, OK, let's think about a holistic strategy. Um, but engaging that and always with the mindset of how does this what how is this relevant to my community is this what they want are they going to you know what are the reason what are the reason the community would visit my world or do x y or z and then always with that idea of co-creation potentially in the future of fandom so um you know even even with some of the luxury the high end luxury brands that i work with it's even taking a step back and thinking about the high net worth individuals of the future like what do they want like they might still want the very expensive beautiful purse in the physical world Right, because people still want to flex. Um, but how does that work in, in the virtual space? Does it have to be a purse? Right, so those are the questions I work with them, uh, work, work with them on and, and kind of really thinking about that, right? And also if you are a super high-end luxury brand, um, that is aspirational. You are an aspirational brand to many people. What other ways can you add, can you work, you know, can you start inserting your, your brand into someone's life but, you know, not necessarily having them buy a specific good in a physical form that are very expensive, but maybe there's smaller ways, right, to start to create that brand engagement so that when they're older or when they have more disposable income, you become that brand that they actually want to buy. Like many times when you hear someone like, oh, I just closed the deal, they go buy, you know, a, a beautiful purse or they buy a Tesla or they buy, like there's certain things that they will <laughs> reward themselves with, right? So how do we, how do we also create those relationships in these spaces? Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely, you know, there's a lot of, of work that I do with the brands and really sitting down, thinking hard through this and analyzing community and, um, and yeah, and, and just, you know, like to me, it's like, it has to be valuable. It has to bring value to the community. If you're not bringing value, if you're just launching a world for the sake of it, you're not doing it right. All right. Let, let's talk a little bit about the transition out of purely virtual spaces and into physical ones because you brought it up mm -hmm. a moment ago but the metaverse is all around us it's virtual spaces that we go into like rec room or world of warcraft and roblox and decentraland all these things that are being created that we go into but the metaverse is going to surround us everywhere so okay. it includes going back into physical reality so the way we're most likely going to access that is through things like augmented reality glasses. Now, granted, technology has a long way to go to be, yep. you know, on our heads long enough 
at a high enough level of resolution and all that. But let's dream for a moment. Uh, we have some devices out there like Snap Spectacles, for example, that kind of gives you a glimpse into it in, the, in like the 30 minute battery life. You've got things like the <laughs> Facebook Ray-Ban Stories that kind of gives you a sense of maybe what the form factor might look like someday. But let, let's imagine this future where we can wear a very lightweight, stylish headset. Actually, it occurs to me as we talk about this, like the headset itself will become a fashion statement in the future. But oh, yeah. beyond, beyond that, like how is it going to affect our self-expression and fashion and avatars, all, all that other stuff that we were just covering in the physical world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the people that are watching this on YouTube, like that's my Magic Leap one from when I work at Magic, we used to work at Magic Leap. And I think people underestimate, just like you mentioned, they underestimate how hard it is to put a supercomputer on someone's face. <laughs> that is really hard work. Um, yeah. from, right? Battery life, sensors, optics, like this is a hard mm. problem to solve people. It's not going to come just like that. Um, but, I, 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 you know, it's interesting because one of the brands that I'm working with, we are actually, you know, helping them prepare for that future. Like that sounds super futuristic and like, like when is that going to happen? But we're starting to think about in the long term, how do you prepare when we're engaging, you know, with a wearable? Um, it starts with audio in my perspective and then mm -hmm. moves into the visual, right? The visual is going to be a little bit harder uh, and mm -hmm. then it'll come. But yeah, I think that a lot of the experimentation that we're doing in these virtual spaces will translate in some form into how we engage with virtual in the physical world, right? But it'll be different, right? Because I'm going to be able to kind of... Um, you know, um, have a, you know, have a, what, what, what would I call her? Let's say have like my, uh, my stylist, my virtual stylist, my AI stylist, uh, mm -hmm. show up in front of me in my closet and I'm going to be able to kind of like go through different outfits and then I'm be able to look at myself in my current form and see, Oh, this looks good. This doesn't look good, et cetera. And then eventually I put on the right out outfit. Uh, but you know, the outfits might look different to different people depending on the glasses that they're wearing. Um, so I think it's, it's going to evolve and change and, and, you know, fabric connectivity, that's all evolving as well. So what does it look like? <clears throat> I think we're all trying to start trying to figure that out. I think we have a better idea of what it hap what it looks like in the virtual space, right? And that's evolving in itself. I'm really interested in thinking about fashion also in that physical world metaverse that will be enabled in the future, right? That is not here yet. Um, once we're in some type of wearable and, and, and audio and, you know, I think, yeah, I don't know what it looks like, right? Right? It would, I can guess and I can have ideas and I wrote a whole article about it, but I think that it'll, it's powerful to now work with a brand to be able to envision that. Um, so I feel very lucky to be able to do that, right? And really think through that with them. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, so one of the things that sort of relates to this that I wanted to be able to talk about a little bit because it's an area of, I think, confusion or misconceptions for people around avatars is the idea of interoperability, the interoperability of fashion components, because I think some people hear, oh, I, I buy a dress in a, visit, in a virtual world, a lot of the value will be, do I get to take that dress with me from experience to experience? And then that clashes with this notion that people have who've come at it more from like a online games perspective, and they'll be like, well, no one's going to allow World of Warcraft costume to end up in League of Legends, right? Mm -hmm. the, and to me, these are not, um, it's kind of a false dichotomy, right? Like these, we're going to have virtual worlds that are very aesthetically crafted and are built for a particular art direction. Mm -hmm. And also for a lot of game design reasons in those, you may not have like total interoperability. There's this whole other domain, which is more social. It's maybe about mm -hmm. music experiences and different kinds of experiences that are maybe game-like or informed by games, but it's not like playing World of Warcraft. The interoperability of the avatar is going to be much different in those worlds, more informed by something I think of like Roblox, right? So Roblox, you yeah. do have a certain amount of interoperability and people go from experience to experience that's maybe what these social experiences look like. And that's different from the games that we're accustomed to in the past, where it might be like a theme park where everything is defined for you. That's how I think about it. But, it, but that's what I tell people to keep in mind 
when they hear interoperability, don't think that this is a one size fits all kind of yeah. problem where it's you know, everybody's got to have interoperability everywhere yeah. or don't do it at all. And I'm just curious what you think about in terms of this interoperability concern that people tend yeah. to have. So I think that there's two components when we, when we think about the, you know, the future metaverse, right? Um, like the ideal, right? The ideal that many of us are working towards is open and decentralized. Does it have to be all fully decentralized? Probably not. Right. Open. Yeah, I, I think open is a good thing. You know, open standards. Those are things like, is everyone going to be open? I don't know. I think there will be kind of a big component of that open decentralized uh, where we're going to be able to port things from one place to another that doesn't currently exist in a, in a big scale. Right. Uh, but there will still be some walled gardens and there might be good reasons to go into mm -hmm. those walled gardens. Right. I think it's going to evolve. I don't think it's all going to be open and decentralized over here. That's a, an ideal. It doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. Right. So I think we'll see an evolution. Um, you know, there will be, like I said, some of those centralized, the more closed places that there might be a reason for us to go there. So, you know, and, and the idea is, and the, and the concept and the idea that everything we create is going to be transferred into every game and it's going to be read in the same way. Like, that's hard. Like, address, you know, if you're developing an Unreal, it doesn't mean that everything you port into a Unity-based game is going to, you know, show up. Like, that, that is hard. Those are hard things to do. So... I do think that there are, you know, different um, working groups and organizations working on figuring out some type of standard, right? IEEE has a virtual good standard group that I think is quite interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I know Kronos Group has been thinking through some open standards for a while. Um, you've got the Blockchain Game Alliance. Like, there's different groups that are starting to kind of think through it. Um, you know, is there going to be a battle at some point when it comes to, like, standards? Probably. Um, <clears throat> so I think that it's an interesting thing to, to say, you know... Does everything have to be, does everything have to be interoperable? No, it doesn't. Interoperability is really nice to have. Has it been solved? No, not really. That's a very, you know, that, 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 that's a hard problem to solve. Um, but you know, I, I do wish there is some level of inter interoperability, but I don't think we should bog down, bog down ourselves on just saying like, it has to be, interoperability has to be always there. Um, or, you know, it has to be open and decentralized. I think this is obviously, like you said, a very big conversation. And it's not either or for me, just like you said. Yeah. To me, the exciting part is the disruptiveness of it, because now I, as a creator, could potentially make a world with an experience there and actually invite everybody in with their self-expression into that space. And guess what? I no longer have to build all of that and supply all that content. Yes. Like, that's an enormous amount of work. If you create World of Warcraft or an MMORPG, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Like, enormous work for hundreds of developers a lot of times on the, on the big AAA kind yeah. of worlds. And to not have to do that so that I can be like that Roblox creator who makes the little fashion game or some other experience, like an Adopt Me, for example. Like, these are just things that would not be publishable games, but they are completely awesome experiences for a whole group of people to have within these spaces, again, because of the disruptiveness of it. All the things they didn't have to build to conceive of that, that little piece. Kathy, we're, we're coming up at, at the end of the talk, and I just wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to let anybody know about really any super cool projects that you've got your eye on that people should check out, and also where they can learn more about your work and follow some of the things that you're doing and talking about, whether it's fashion, avatars, which we've focused our time on today, but more broadly, you cover a lot of things in the metaverse. So please feel free to, to share with my audience here anything that you think they should know about that's pertinent to the subjects we've covered. Yeah, so definitely LinkedIn, I think, is the best place to connect with me or follow me. Like, I share a lot of content there. Um, I just uh, recently got access to the LinkedIn audio events uh, mm. feature, so I'm going to be starting to do that more often. <clears throat> and I think it's going to be, you know, a great place. I think LinkedIn is going to be a great place to have really smart conversations about this. Um, so very, very excited about that. So, you know, check, connect with me or follow me on LinkedIn for that. Um, my Forbes articles, you can find me in Forbes as well. I write a lot about virtual fashion, metaverse, crypto, blockchain, NFTs, you name it. Um, <clears throat> definitely, you know, uh, I have a new book coming out, The Metaverse Economy, end of Q1, mm -hmm. hopefully. Uh, so check that out. And then right now working on season two of the Metaverse Marketing uh, Podcast, which was very, very, very well received in season one. So, um, so yeah, you know, just connect with me. I try to share as much as I can. And, um, and yeah, just excited to be here. Thank you, John.
Yeah, thanks, Kathy. And we'll include links to all that in the show notes. And if you're encountering this through the podcast or the video, I've got my Building the Metaverse blog, which I'd love you to, to check out. You can find me on Twitter and just follow the posts that I make there. My day job is actually building the metaverse for real. I'm building it at Beamable. We're trying to create an environment to enable people to build games and ultimately any kind of metaverse experience without having to like figure out all the backend technology. Essentially, like all the stuff Roblox gives you, but with the freedom to do it wherever you want and that open decentralized method that, that we were touching upon earlier. So this has been a super fun conversation, Kathy. I hope this opens people's minds to a lot of other possibilities. I hope it gives people a lot of imagination and curiosity about this space, but we are, we're setting out on something new. This isn't just a direct continuity from existing things. We see some early signs of it, maybe Roblox and Rec Room and online games. But when this becomes ubiquitous, it opens up a whole new realm of self-expression and digital identity for people. And, and that's the culture trend that I actually think is at the forefront of this. I think the metaverse is first and foremost to me, a culture trend, a culture change that's going through the world, supported by the technology, but it wouldn't be happening without that culture change. So I'm, I'm glad that's what we were actually able to talk about a little bit today. So thanks for being here on Building the Metaverse. This is a lot of fun. Thank you so much.